Hopefully, by having two columns in your planning, you'll remember to analyse the evidence and not just describe it. The second column forces you to explain why the issues you're describing can be seen as a turning point. If you have a preference for a spider diagram, then you could try writing your assessment in a different colour. When you come to write the essay, it will remind you that you always have to relate your points back to the question. Just describing the events of 1921 and showing how the events can be seen as a turning point is the difference between a borderline essay and a very good essay. In this section, we're going to investigate aspects of the rule of Henry VII and developments that occurred in England during that time period. We're going to aim to focus on three areas. The creation of political stability, Henry VII's foreign policy, and developments within the economy and the church. Although we're going to focus mostly on the reign of Henry VII, it's important to check out what went on around him, such as the reigns of the Yorkist kings, Edward IV, Richard III, and the early part of Henry VIII's reign. Within this section, we're going to be looking at the church, enclosure, and the development of trade routes. We'll start by looking at questions that test your understanding of a key term linked to your course. Now these tend to be low mark questions, so don't be tempted to write too much. You'll need this valuable thinking time when it comes to the evaluation questions later on in the paper. To help you to remember this, questions will often be worded with phrases such as briefly explain or comment on. For example, comment on the meaning of absenteeism in the context of the church in the late 15th century. Now absenteeism refers to the absence of a priest or bishop from his parish or diocese. Well, I know I said briefly, but a little bit more is needed to develop this statement and address the final part of the question in the context of the church in the late 15th century. Now absenteeism had been a common feature of medieval church for a long time. This usually came as a result of pluralism and the practice of the monarch who used positions in the church as a form of patronage. Many of the king's most trusted counsellors would also hold bishoprics. However, their duties meant that they would be unable to fulfil the obligations of their church positions. For example, Richard Fox was both keeper of the privy seal and held several bishoprics. Other church priests had administrative duties to carry out for the church and were given a parish from which they could draw an income from, but did not carry out any spiritual role. One of the key issues in studying foreign policy of this period is Britain's entry into World War I in August 1914. In the years leading up to this, Britain's relationship with Germany was strained and this is the focus of our next question. Was tension between Britain and Germany in the years 1898 to 1914 a result of the creation of the Triple Entente? Often questions will ask you to consider the causes of a decline in relations between Britain and Germany. As with other causation questions that are looking at your skills of evaluation, they're likely to require you to weigh up the significance of one cause against other factors. OK, so let's answer that first question. The Triple Entente was an agreement of understanding between Britain and France in 1904 and Britain and Russia in 1907. Russia and France had already formalised relations in the Franco-Russian alliance of 1894. To Germany, this represented a breakdown of its policy to keep France diplomatically isolated to ensure German security. Germany now fell under threat of the possibility of facing a war on two fronts. The Schlieffen Plan, devised to combat this threat, relied on a swift victory over France. If the British supported France, this would be unlikely. Germany's reaction to this resulted in attempts to place the relationship Britain had with France under pressure. By provoking the Moroccan crises, 
Germany believed it would weaken British support for France. This, however, only served to strengthen ties between Britain and France, as demonstrated by the signing of the Naval Agreement in 1912. It deepened tension between Britain and Germany. Seen in the wider European context, there were now two alliance systems in operation in Europe. It also meant that conditions tolerated under war to ensure the whites didn't win were no longer acceptable. In the countryside, peasants revolted against grain requisitioning. The Red Army was brutal in quashing uprisings. Disturbances spread to the towns and cities where trouble in the countryside had led to severe food shortages for urban workers. This acted as a turning point, as it meant Lenin realised he would not be able to establish a stable government without the cooperation of the peasants. It would have an impact on the creation of the new economic policy. In March 1921, sailors at the Kronstadt naval base mutinied in support of demonstrators and strikers in Petrograd and issued a 15-point programme condemning the Bolshevik government. They were again suppressed by the Red Army two weeks after beginning the revolt, but they had a lasting impact on government policy. An experiment by Rosenthal and Jacobson in 1968 demonstrated the process of the self-fulfilling prophecy. They conducted an experiment in an elementary school. Each pupil was given an IQ test. They then randomly selected 20 pupils and informed their teacher that these pupils would experience a significant increase in their intelligence. After one year, all the pupils were given a second IQ test. The 20 pupils randomly selected showed a marked improvement in the IQ scores. Amazingly so, Rosenthal and Jacobson found that the teacher's behaviour to these 20 pupils had changed during the year. This was because they were teaching in a more positive and encouraging way. The pupils then thought that they were more intelligent because of these labels and therefore worked harder. Today, punning may seem a bit cheesy as a form of humour, but it was extraordinarily popular with Elizabethan and Jacobean audiences. For example, in lines 20 to 21 in Act 2, Scene 1, where Gonzalo picks up on the wager Antonio and Sebastian are making fun about him in order to make fun of his age and his sincerity. Sebastian says, Look, he's winding up the watch of his wit when Sebastian bets a dollar. Quick as a flash, Shakespeare makes Gonzalo more than equal to the occasion. Not only does the dramatist allow Gonzalo to pick up on their mocking of him, but Shakespeare does this through punning. By making Gonzalo cleverly repeat the word dollar, he twists a double meaning from it by using dollar, a word which sounds the same but means grief. He does this in order to bring the conversation back to the character's more serious purpose. Notice too the importance of the stage directions here, which suggests Prospero starts suddenly and speaks. The Tempest has more detailed stage directions than any other Shakespeare play. However, it seems to use more pared down language and action than any of his other plays. Study these. The mask is described as a vision or a theatrical illusion of universal dimension. Use of the great globe may remind us of this dimension, a reference to the theme of voyages of discovery which frame the drama juxtaposed with a possible reference to the Globe Theatre itself. The poeticism of gorgeous places and cloud-capped towers is contrasted with the baseless fabric and insubstantial pageant of theatrical illusion, the fading artifice of the theatre and the play. Shakespeare also seems to be preoccupied with the concept of transformation in this play. His use of cloud caps represents his increasing lexical inventiveness through coining new combinations of words. This makes the language spoken by the characters in the play possibly more compressed and intense than in any of his other dramas. 